you high this morning, Father. We celebrate you, giver of life. We want to honor you, our strength, our God, the one who does not fail, the one who is ever faithful, ever sure, so reliable, so dependable. And you are unchanging the way you were yesterday you are today. What you did in those days, you are still doing today. We have come to say thank you. We have come to celebrate you. We want to honor you. We know that you are so good, so reliable. Thank you for being so kind to us. Thank you for your protection throughout the week. Thank you for your goodness in every aspect of our lives. Thank you for loving us with all loving kindness. You are the one who protects us from evil. You have not allowed the enemy to ask where our God was. Thank you, ancient of days. Even when we didn't know there was trouble ahead of us. You defended us. When the enemy thought they have cornered us, you showed up. Oh, Father, we are grateful. Thank you for being so good to us. What you said you will do, that is what you will do. That is why you are called Jehovah. What you say you will do, that is what you will do. That is why you are called Jehovah. Jehovah, that is why you are called Jehovah. Jehovah, me, oh, that is why you are called Jehovah. Jehovah, what 
you said you will do. That is what you will do. That is why you are called Jehovah. Elisha, Elewi, Elewi, Elisha. Ori no leshe je oluwa. Elisha, Elewi o, Elewi, Elisha. Ori no leshe je oluwa. Tori no, Tori no, la shenge, Oluwa. Oluwa, Oluwa, Ashe o Baba Ashe o Thank you, ancient of days. Let our worship be acceptable in your sight, Father. Renew our strength. Release your glory. Release your presence into our midst. Do 
mighty things for everyone. Thank you, Lord, for answer prayer. In Jesus' name we worship. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus. Uh, the Lord is good. Please sit down in the presence of God. I want to welcome you to the presence of God this morning. It's good to see your lovely faces. Now in the past few Sundays, I've been taking time to teach a little about Adonai. Or call him the Christ. The incarnated one. We saw him pre-incarnation. We saw his incarnation. And I've been trying to explain some things to you about him being Adonai. I told you that he's Lord of all things and has to be Lord in your life to be able to save you. If he's not Lord in your life, then he cannot save you. I told you that one. I told you that he's the king of our kingdom. You know, every kingdom has a king. If there's no, if, if there's no king, then there can be a kingdom. Kingdom, the domain of a king. So if there's a kingdom, then there must be a king. Alright, and I told you that he is the king of our kingdom. We are subjects of his kingdom. Again, I told you that he is our access to the throne of God. And our connection to every spiritual, every, uh, spiritual blessings. It's our connection. Without, it's our legal tender in the spiritual realm. That's what it means. You can't do anything in the spiritual realm without him. Just like you spend money to buy, to, to do things. He is the, the currency we spend in the spiritual realm. When you go into the spiritual realm, whatever you want to do in the spiritual realm, that's the currency. Jesus. When you are confronted with demonic powers and you need to wriggle your way out, eh? your currency at that time is not incantation. It's not the Yoruba sayings. Eh? You know there are plenty of Yoruba sayings that we are used to. Can you remind me one? I'm trying to remember one. Who is Yoruba here? Oh, what's your ah, There's a Yoruba woman here. Yoruba woman. <laughs> oh, what's your get Those are Yoruba sayings. They may not be incantation, actually. They are just normal things. If you plant plantain, you will see that when it stretch out its leaf, the leaf will eventually come down. So it's a simple Yoruba saying. But that does not work in the spiritual realm for you. So when you, when you are confronted with a demonic situation, what currency do you have? The name of Jesus. When you say, in the name of Jesus, whoever, whatever force is against you will shrink backwards. They will step backwards. Because that means you know who you are. The Bible says you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Alright, so I, I explained that to us, that he's our asses. Finally, last week, I introduced him to you as the savior of the world. And he's the only one who can save. 
I even told you why he's the only one. Because he's the only one that broke the power of sin. That paid for sin. You can't save man unless you pay for their sins. There is no prophet, whether Shinto, or Buddha, or whoever. All the great, great prophets, they are all great in their rights. They are all great too. And they have followings, plenty of people following them. Great, great people. But none of them can save anybody. They are good leaders, good teachers. They have character. Some of them have good characters and so on. They are great in their rights. But none of them can save. And none of them claim that they can save. Go, if you check their teachings, check their sayings, none of them. One of them was approached by his followers. Said, what is our hope, we that are following you? And the man said, ah, even me, myself, I don't know my hope. Oh. I don't know what will happen to me at the end. Oh. Only one person knows what will happen at the end and said it. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And that is Jesus Christ. He cleansed your sins and gave you access before God. So he is our savior. Today I want to add one addition to that. I want you to know him as the anointed one. The Christ. The anointed one. So you can title the message today, Adonai, the Anointed One. Christ, or Adonai, the Anointed One. The word Christ means the Anointed One. It's translated from the Greek word Christos, which means the Anointed One. And in Hebrew, is Messiah. Messiah. The same word. Christ. Anointed one. Messiah. All the three phrases or state, uh, words are saying the same thing. In Greek, it is Christos. In uh, English, they call it Christ. But in Hebrew, is Messiah. All of those words are all saying the same thing. The anointed one. That's the meaning. Therefore, Jesus Christ is the one that God gave special abilities to do what others could not do. To heal the sick, to deliver the oppressed, and things like that. I'll come to that very soon. When he was baptized in the Jordan River by prophet John to show you that he did not despise any prophets, he went to prophet John to be baptized in the water. And John dipped him inside River Jordan. That was the year he was 30 years old. He dipped him in the water and he came out from the water. Just like the baptism that we all did. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sh <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sure we all have been baptized in water at one time or another after you gave your life to Jesus Christ. That's what he did also. He was baptized. And after he was baptized and he came out, as he came out from the water, the spirits came from heaven and came upon him. And that moment he received the anointing from heaven. The anointing from heaven. That's the anointing I'm talking about. Now let me explain this. Let's go further. Open your Bible to Luke chapter 4. My interest is I need you to know what you need to know. I don't want you to be tossed around with strange doctrines, strange ideas. You need to know what the Bible says. You need to know who you are following. Okay? So look chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 16. 
The Bible says, so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was under the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Verse 20, then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He announced for everybody there to know that the promised anointing has come upon him. Then, he went ahead to do mighty things. Mighty works everywhere. Go back to that Luke chapter 4. Let's go forward to verse 40 and 41. And you see how he manifested in the anointing. Look at verse 40. He said, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Hallelujah. Even demons recognized him as the Christ, the Savior, the one who is meant to deliver the world. When he completed his ministry and left, one of his key followers, his disciples, Peter, gave an account of his ministry. And what he said was so profound, he summarized everything. He was, he was talking to in the house of a certain military officer called Cornelius. And he was introducing Jesus to Gentiles. And he made a profound comment about him in Acts chapter 10 verse 38. Let us read it. Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. He said, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him and ni jesu christi ti nazareth eni ti olorun da emi mimo ati agbara le lori o nkiri sore o se didara gbogbo awon ti esu npon loju god anointed him and he went about doing good healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him now the word anointing that is being referred to that I've been talking about all this while is from a Greek word which is called mashiach mashiach which means you don't need the spelling you don't you are not doing an exam so you are not going to be writing the... So I don't need to give you the spelling of Mashiach. Abefe mo. You don't need that one. Mashiach means the special ability of God given to an individual that makes him or enables him to do what 
is considered extraordinary. What other people cannot do? The power of God given to an individual that makes him to be able to do what other people cannot do. Thus making him extraordinary. And that's what we call anointing. He came upon Jesus and made him different from every other person. Singled him out among the crowd. That's what I'm talking about this morning. That he was anointed. Adonai, our anointed king, is the Christ. Now there are many dimensions to his anointing. But for your reference this morning, I just want to tell you five of his anointing. Five of his anointing. Five dimensions of his anointing. The anointing is vast. It's plenty. The manifestation is plenty. But I just want to talk about five. I don't want to I don't want to aggra I mean to, 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 to burden you with so many at the same time. I want to just limit to five because there are five fingers on my hand. And I think there are five on your hand also. <laughs> so that it will be easy for you to remember. Five. I, would, I just pick five out of his uh, dimensions of grace. And I want to talk about it. Number one. He was anointed to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to the poor and downtrodden people. Anointed to preach the gospel of the kingdom. He was anointed to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the poor. Not to everybody, but to the poor and downtrodden. The people who are powerless, people who are eager to receive. He's not, he didn't come to convince the learned. He didn't come to convince the educated, the scribes, the Pharisees, the, 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 the people who claim to be holy. No. He didn't come for kings, high priests. No. He was anointed to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the poor. If you read, you know, he read to us. He was not the one who chose what he's going to do. Nobody can determine what he is going to do. We all do what we receive from above. Huh? No man can receive anything except it is given to him from above. So the first assignment that his anointing did was to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the poor and the downtrodden. And I'm saying it was not sent to people who are full of pride. People who are full of their self, themselves. But to the poor. Who knows that they need help? People who want help. People who know that they are, they are not good enough. They are, not, they are sinners. They are weak. They need help. They, those are the people he came for. And if you pay attention to his entire ministry, you will notice that he never really went to the rich. He never really went to them. There was no time he attempted to convince the high priests about his calling. There was no time he went to see any king to tell him about the kingdom. There was no time he went to see any governor and tell them about the kingdom. No. In fact, when the Pharisees, when the scribes came to him, he was hostile to them because he was not sent to them. He didn't have any business with them. I want to leave. I want to go. That's one of his popular sayings. He is not out for the, 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 the wise people. He's not out for the great people. No, 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 no. He has come for the poor. Of course, he never rejected the rich who came to meet him. There was a certain man called, uh, uh, what's his name now? John chapter, chapter 3. Uh, uh, Nicodemus, thank you. Nicodemus was one of the powerful men 
He could not come during the day. He came to meet Jesus in the night. And Jesus did not say, go away, I'm sleeping. Mm -mm. He attended to him. He attended to him. There were some rich people who became his friends. They, they, but it, when you look at those rich people, they are people who humbled themselves and came to meet him. There were people who came and you requested for help. He helped them. Because even though they are rich in wealth, they were poor in spirit. Those are the people he related with. All his disciples, where did it, who are the disciples of Jesus? There were some people who were fishers. They were catching fish. And Jesus went and met them and said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Fishers! Those are the least, the least people in the society. Least people. Those are the kind of people he made his disciples. Because his assignment was the, for, the, for the poor. Not for the rich. Not for the highly positioned men. That's the reason also why all his teachings and parables were very simple. Very, very simple. That's why I was shocked one day when somebody was doing a teaching. and He said, they are the ones who can interpret scriptures for you. That you cannot understand scripture by yourself. There is no teaching of Jesus that you need an interpreter for. That you need a, 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 is it interpreter? That you need somebody to explain to you. On your own, when you read it, you will understand. He said, a certain sower went out to sow his seed. He threw some. He threw it out. Some fell by the wayside. Some fell uh, in the midst of uh, thorns. Some fell in the midst of uh, the rock. And then some fell on good soil. Those who fell on the good soil, I mean, those who fell by the wayside, the birds of the air came and ate it up. The one that fell among thorns, the thorns grew up and squeezed them. The one that fell among the rock did not do well because there was no root. And the one that fell on the good soil, some of them yielded 30, 30 fold, some 60 fold. Is that difficult to understand? Do you need an interpreter to explain that? Anybody can understand that. That's the way his teachings were. All his allegories were symbol, or his symbols. Allegories and symbols. All of them were things that you understand. Everybody understood them. That's why when he was preaching here on earth, the larger crowd of people who were with him were the common people. Because they understood what he was saying. Hello. Are you still with me? He was anointed to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the poor, people like me, people like you. So that uneducated people could understand. Okay, so that's the first anointing he carried. He was anointed to teach us about the kingdom of God. And there is nothing else you need to know about the kingdom of God that is not in him. Everything you need to know about the kingdom, you find them in his teachings. You find them in Jesus Christ. You don't need to see any other prophet anywhere. You say, ah, there's another prophet that came. Because when Jesus finished, he didn't finish everything. He left some unfinished. And so another prophet came. Ah, 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 ah. And they will be telling you that he even said that he's sending another comforter after him. So they are the prophet, the new prophets. I read, you know, I read about, I, I read in his, in his, uh, in his, in the, in the truth. Eh? What's the title of that their book again? In the light of truth, yeah, of uh, great uh, movement, written by Abdushin, and he claimed that Jesus said there's going to be another comforter coming after him, who will teach you. What he couldn't teach you. He so said he is the he is the he is the, he is the comforter. The other person coming after Jesus. But that's not true. Jesus specified who he was talking about. Who was he talking about? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that is going to come to dwell inside you. Not, not that is going to appear somewhere and will be writing something for you. No. 
He is dwelling inside of you. The Holy Spirit that is going to come to dwell inside you and will explain to you the things that Jesus said that you didn't understand. Not that somebody is going to come and teach something that is esoteric, something that is different from the word of God. So, he's anointed to teach us about the kingdom of God. Everything you need to know about the kingdom, they are inside him. That's number one. The second anointing, the second dimension of his anointing. He had a special prophetic anointing. He is the prophet of the New Testament. Moses gave a prophecy before he died. You know, Moses, Moses was a special prophet. In the Old Testament, there were a lot of prophets. A lot of prophets. But Moses was in a special class. In fact, if you want to use the language of the New Testament, Moses was not just a prophet, he was also an apostle. Because he laid the foundation of the Old Testament. He was the one who went to meet the Lord and received the testament and established the structures of that testament, of, I mean, of that covenant. So he was an apostle in the Old Testament. And he said in Deuteronomy chapter 18, let me read it from verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses, when he was getting ready to, to go, you know the whole of the book of Deuteronomy was written by Moses after God had told him to go and die. God had told Moses, you will be climbing that mountain, Abarim, and you are going to die. So get ready to go. So Moses took his pen and began to write down things. I'm sure he took permission from God. I said, okay, since I'm going to die, let me just communicate what I need to communicate with these people. And he began to write and write. Just by the river Jordan, he wrote all the book of Deuteronomy. The whole of it. Now, in this chapter 18, starting from verse 15, he said something that is very significant. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. A prophet like me. From your midst. From your brethren. Him you shall hear. Him you shall hear. I take it again. According to all you desired of the Lord, your God, in Horeb. Sorry, where am I reading? I'm correct. Yes, verse 16. According to all you desire of the Lord, your God, in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. Verse 17. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. And we put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. Let me stop there. Now, if you, in my own Bible, I don't know, I don't think it's like that in every Bible. In my own Bible... That prophet was capitalized. Uh -huh. Capital letter, nothing. Sorry. Prophet, him. You know, it was making reference to him in terms of capital letters. In my own translation. I don't know what. I think in James, King James uh, version did not. But my own is New King James. The one. Huh? Sorry? His capital. Prophet is capital. Him, his, is not capital. So, but in my own, everywhere reference was made to him, it was capital letter. He's not just a prophet. He said, he shall be a prophet like me. Like me. Like Moses, in that he's going to bring testament. He's going to bring principles is going to bring a new covenant like I brought a covenant it will teach the world about God it will teach the world about the doctrine of God 
That's what Moses said about that prophet that was coming. This prophet is not going to be like Elisha. This prophet is not going to be like Elijah. You know, all those ones are great prophets also. But none of them brought covenants. None of them brought testament. Moses was the only prophet in the Old Testament that brought uh, a testament. So like me, another prophet God is going to raise for you who would bring uh, the commandment or the testament of God to you. But he is bigger than Moses because he, he had been before Moses. He warned, Moses warned specifically that they should listen to that prophet. And I said in my own Bible that prophet is capitalized to implicate that this prophet is not human but God. In essence, he is a prophet with a difference. Different dimensions of authority. Not like other prophets. Let me explain that to you. Every prophet teaches based on the prophets that have gone ahead of him. When, when John was preaching as a prophet, as a prophet, he was quoting the teachings of Moses. He was quoting what other prophets, Isaiah and all of them, have said before him. But when Jesus was teaching, people observed that he taught, he did not teach like the scribes. He was not just quoting scriptures. He was talking with authority. There was a dimension of authority that he had. No, let, me, let me show you where they said that in the Bible. Matthew chapter 7, verse 25. Matthew chapter 7, verse 25. Let's read it to verse 26. Have you found a place? Sorry. Let's start from verse 26 to 27. What am I saying? Sorry, 28, Jerry. So it was from verse 28, 28 and 29. Yes. So it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. What's the meaning of that? He said, the Bible said, he taught them like somebody who had authority. What authority were they referring to? Let me show you, let me tell you one of such. He was teaching about uh, divorcement. And he said, Moses told you that you can do this. But this is what I say. <laughs> now, that's authority. That's a dimension of authority that was strange. Nobody dare say Moses was wrong. But Jesus said Moses was wrong. He said, Moses told you that you can divorce your wife for any reason. But it was not so from the beginning. This is what I say, therefore. He, he was talking with an authority that was bigger than that of Moses. Do you understand now? That's why they said he spoke like somebody who had authority. He had some dimension of audacity that was strange in his teachings. At a point, they said some things to him. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Hello? Before Abraham was born, before Abraham came, I am. I am. There's somebody there in your right breast. You have a challenge there in your right breast. I think that person should be inside the hall. Yeah. Please come. Let me pray for you. Right in the right, around the right breast, like this. Zeleko Shata Helia Sapate. I break the power of that limitation. Come on. Nekape Sutua. I destroy that arrow. Come on, get out of her. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, ancient of days. So, he spoke like somebody who had authority. 
because he was a special prophet. There were several issues where he corrected Moses. Not one, so several places where he corrected Moses. He said, Moses said, don't, don't kill your brother. But anybody who say raka to his brother in his heart, he has, he's already a murderer. He was talking another dimension of wisdom that was beyond human understanding. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that he is our prophet. He's the prophet of the New Testament. He's the prophet of the New Testament. He carried the anointing of a prophet that was unique, that was different. Every other person we recognize as prophets today are his errand boys. They are sons of the prophet. He is the real prophet. The real prophet of the New Testament is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Are you with me? He is our prophet. He is the one we must follow. Men are incidental. Prophets like Olo Shoyo, they are incidental. You will be with them for some time and then you go on. Prophets like Adeboye, they are incidental. They will be there for some time and then they will die and they will not be there again. Prophets like Babalola, they are incidental. They just come up and they serve for some time and then they go. But there's a prophet that is the prophet of all prophets. And that is Jesus Christ. That's the one you must always respond to. You must listen to him every time. If Olawoshoyo tells you to do something that is contrary to scriptures, you reject him. You put it aside. The only prophet that you must always obey. Who is that prophet? Who is that prophet? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is a prophet of the New Testament. Tell somebody beside you. Jesus is the prophet of the New Testament. He is our prophet. He is my prophet. He should be your prophet also. Number three. He carried the healing anointing. The healing anointing. The Bible said he went everywhere doing good and healing all kinds of afflictions. I don't need to begin to give you examples. You know them. Bartimaeus was blind. That woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. Plenty, plenty healings. Plenty healings everywhere that he did. Now, from the beginning, God revealed himself to the Israelites as Jehovah Rophekah. He said, I am the Lord that healed thee. I am Jehovah Rophekah. I am your healer. That is, I am the one that will heal you. That's the way God revealed himself to the Israelites when they were coming to the, to the promised land. And in Exodus chapter 24, verse, I mean 23, verse 25 to 26, he said, You will serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. And he will take sickness away from you. So he revealed himself as the one who takes away sickness. The one who heals when affliction comes. He manif God manifested himself as that. There was a time as they were traveling in the, in the, in the, in the forest. That snakes was attacking them. They went, they misbehaved, they did some things they shouldn't do. And so snakes came and started attacking them. And they cried unto Moses. Moses cried unto God. What do we do about this? They are, these snakes are killing your people. And God said, Make a molten image, put it up. Anyone that the snake bites should look at it. When you see that molten image, the venom of the snake will be neutralized. He, he ministered healing to people in various ways. There was a time the water they were drinking was, was uh, poisonous. He told prof, that prophet to cut a tree and throw it inside the water. And instantly, 
that problem was resolved. He was the real healer, God himself. Now, in those days, one of the ways by which they recognized his prophets was the healing grace. That every one of them that manifested as a prophet, they had a healing grace upon them. Elijah had a healing grace upon him. Elisha had the healing grace upon him. And they all minister healing by instruction from above. You remember the leper, what's his name now? Naaman from Syria who came to see Elisha. What did Elisha ask him to do? Huh? You remember? He told him to go and dip himself in the water in the river Jordan. And when he did that, the leprosy was cured. That's how prophets manifested in the Old Testament. And then they say, ah, a great prophet is among us. That's how they knew them that time. Now when Jesus came to the world also, he manifested that same healing grace. But this time around it was extraordinary. And that's why most Israelites who believed him recognized him as a prophet of God. The dimension of healing that was seen with him was beyond understanding. It was higher, much higher than any other prophet before him. I've read, yeah, I've read that before. How he went somewhere and they began to bring sick people to him. And the Bible said, all of them were healed. That's verse 40 to 41 that we read the other time. In uh, John chapter, in Luke chapter, chapter 4. He went there. And the Bible said, people were coming to him from everywhere. And all of them received their healings. But he did not function as God. He functioned as a prophet. I used to think that when Jesus was here on earth, he was doing those miracles because God was here with us. But that's not exactly the situation. He was a man, but a prophet of God. That's why you will notice that there were two dimensions of healings that happened with him. There were two dimensions of healings. You can break all the healings that happened in Jesus into two categories. The first one are those who believe in him. Those who came to meet him and asked for help. And you remember that the Bible says you believe the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophet and you will prosper. People believe in him and they came to meet him. That's why most times when you see somebody come to meet him, he will ask the person, do you believe I can do this? Hello? You are still with me? Do you believe I can do this? And he says, yes, you are the, 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 the Christ. You are the only one. Then he said, be it unto you according to your faith. People who came to meet him, the woman with the issue of blood, came in the midst of the crowd. Jesus didn't even know. He didn't even talk with Jesus before. She just came and touched the hem of his garment. And the miracle happened. Why? Because of her faith. She believed in that prophet. And the second category are people upon whom the mercy of God came. They didn't believe. They didn't know that the prophet was there. But the mercy of God sorted them out. You know, that's the second dimension of the operation of a prophet. The prophet responds to direction from above. So, those are the two dimensions of healings that Jesus did. For instance, you remember the man at the pool of Bethesda. That man did not have any faith. In fact, when Jesus appeared, when Jesus went to where he was, and Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? The man was talking rubbish. I have nobody. I, 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 and all of that. He didn't have any faith. He didn't know Jesus at all. But he was healed. Why? Because God sent Jesus to him. He said, what I hear, that is what I do. He was told to go there. 
and minister to that man. And you will notice that there were so many sick people there. But it was only that man that he attended to. So, his healing grace operated in two dimensions. The first one was for those who asked for help. And the second one was for those whom God have shown mercy upon. You know what? He died, but he rose from the dead. And he's here now. So before I go on from that, on that message, if you are here today, and you are sick in your body, and you, you believe in him for your healing, I can pray for you now, and you can be healed. If you believe, I said, if you believe. He is my master. I've seen him heal so many people. But only those who believe. So if you are sick in your body and you need healing, and you want him, you believe him, come. I'll just lay hands on you. Because he said we should lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Just come. We see him heal the sick every day. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The only limitation is your faith. Do you believe? You can't deceive in the spiritual realm. If you don't believe, there's nothing anybody can do about it. Or if you believe, you'll be here. Only I command your healing in the name of Jesus. I command your healing in the name of Jesus. Every affliction we break your power in the name of Jesus. 
Thank you, Almighty Father. In Jesus' name we pray. I will hear your testimonies. Number four is the deliverance anointing. Now that's the fourth aspect of his anointing that I'm talking about today. The anointing for deliverance. He was the one that was dead. Yes, he died on the cross at Calvary. And yet, he is alive. And the Bible said he has the keys of hell and of death. Now, when the Bible spoke about keys, he's talking about controlling power. Not physical keys. You know, because those places don't even carry physical locks. They don't carry physical locks. So it's not physical key that he's talking about. He's talking about authority, power. He has dominion over the kingdom of darkness. That's what that place is talking about. In Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27, the prophets prophesy about the end of the oppression of Assyria over Israel. But with deeper understanding of spiritual events, we have discovered that when Isaiah was speaking there, he was giving a reference to another more important event, which is what God effected through the coming of Jesus Christ to the world. Look at it, Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27. He said, it shall come to pass in that day. That's Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. He said, it shall come to pass in that day. Oh, you have not seen Isaiah? If you have not seen it in your own Bible, look up at the screen. It shall come to pass in that day that his body will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. Because of the anointing. He shall be taken away because of the anointing. Because of the anointing. What is he talking about? I said, Isaiah was prophesying about the oppression of Assyria at that time. Because Assyria was the country that uh, put Israel in bondage. By that time, Assyria came. Sennacherib. I'm sure you must have heard about Sennacherib. He was the king of Assyria. And they came and attacked Israel and took over the land of Israel. And the people of Israel became subjugated. They became slaves to Assyria at that time. Now, this Isaiah was talking, this prophet was talking about that time. He said a day is going to come that the yoke of Assyria over Israel shall be broken. And it shall be broken forever. 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 And it will never rise again. Okay? But I'm saying that when he was saying that about Assyria, he was actually prophesying also about the coming of Jesus Christ, how he will destroy the oppression of the devil over the human beings, over our lives. There's somebody, you have this pain in your backbone. That's that backbone. Go, 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 go. The Lord wants me to pray for you again. Please come. The backbone. Go, 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 go. I break the power of that affliction in the name of Jesus. Bone, go back to position. Thank you, Jesus. So he was talking about also about Jesus coming, that he would destroy the yoke of oppression, the power of the devil that is keeping people under oppression. He will destroy it. Aha. Uh -huh. So that scripture meant that God will anoint someone 
and that someone is Jesus. And he will destroy the yoke of the devil over your life. And this devil suppression, there are plenty of them. You sleep at night, something is pressing you down. You are, you, you're struggling to survive in business. Failure upon failure. Disappointment every time. You have a dream like this, disappointment will show up. Things like that, they are oppressions of the devil. So Jesus came to break that spell. That's why the Bible says, For this purpose the Son of God was made manifest, that he might destroy every works of the devil. Every works of the devil. That's number four. And then I go on to number five. Because of my time. Number five. To gather the saints of God at the end. To proclaim the acceptable year of the, of the Lord. That's what he's, he called it. He had been appointed to be the one to proclaim the end of all things. The Christ. Jesus Christ. That is... A day is going to come that he will appear in the sky again. And when he appears in the sky, a lot of things will happen. Actually, the Bible said the trumpet shall sound and he will appear. And those who believe in him who had died will be the first to rise to meet him. Because they will just, you know, when people, are, when people die, we bury them inside the soil. And as they go inside the soil, their body will decay. I, I'm sure you know that. All this, our body will decay. Within a short space of time, it will have become bone. Because all this flesh will rot in a way. Then after some time, even the bone will also decay. Everything will decay eventually. Everything upon your body as it is will decay. But when Jesus appears, every one of us that have died, every human being that have died before he comes, who believe in him as he appears in the sky, he has the anointing to release grace upon them where they are. And a new body will form in them, wherever they are. Whether they died inside water, or they were buried inside the land, or they were buried inside a tree, or they were buried inside whatever. A new flesh will come upon them. But that body will, be, will not be a corruptible body. It won't, it won't be a mortal body like this one that can be destroyed. No, 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 no. It's a new body. It will come into them and they will rise up to meet with him in the sky. The dead in Christ, everyone who believed in him before they died. You know it is appointed unto, unto every man to die once and after that the judgment. After you have died, you cannot believe in Jesus again. But those who believe in, in him while they were alive and have died, they will all rise up. They are the first people to rise, to meet with him in the sky. And then the Bible said, in the twinkle of an eye, those who are still alive, who believe in him, their body also will change. This mortal body will be swallowed up by an immortal body. Your body will change. It will change. And a new body will come out from you. And you will meet with him also in the sky. That is the event we refer to as the rapture. When he will take the saints away. To the marriage feast of the Lamb. There's even a song somebody sang those days. I, I, I think. Let me try to remember. When we get to heaven. At the marriage supper, all the saints shall gather. At the last assembly, no more sad parting, no more heartbreaking. 
Farewell to sorrow. Victory at last. Victory at last. Victory when we get to heaven. At the marriage supper. All, all the saints shall gather. At the last assembly. No more sad parting. No more heartbreaking. Farewell to sorrow. Victory at last. That is a great day is coming. And you must be there on that day. Hello? How many of you are still listening to me? Wave your hands. Oh, praise God. I'm glad. I said a day is coming. That day is a special day. Oh. And I want you to be there on that day. He has an anointing to raise you from the dead. He has anointing to change your body if you are still alive on that day. So that you can take part in that feast. You don't need to do a training on how to fly. You know, there was one, one, one fake preacher that was teaching people how to fly on that day. You don't need anybody to train you. He is anointed. As he appears in the sky. All his disciples, all those who believe in him, they will see him, whether they were dead or they were alive at that time. They will see him and they will become like him. We do, it, it has not appeared what we look like. But when we see him, we will become like him. We will be exactly like him. Our body will be like his body. And then we will meet him in the sky. My desire for you is that you will not miss that day. But you know my fear about that day It's not a day where you can deceive It's not a day, for, a day of deception there are, You know deception can take, has taken place here among men We deceive each as, I mean we deceive ourselves Sometimes it is your husband that gave his life to Christ And you too because you don't want him to be angry with you You pretend to be born again You follow him Sometimes it is your twin brother that gave his life to Christ and you too because you don't want to be left out. You follow. Sometimes it is your uncle your, your, that you are staying with that gave his life to Christ and he's saying he's going to church. Everybody must come. You go with them. You can do all those deceptions. Yeah, those things. But it won't work on that day because you need to be able to receive the body to be able to go. You need to be able to see him to be able to go. In fact, if you are not born again, you won't even know anything is happening. It's not as if you'll be seeing them rising and going. Uh -uh. You won't even know anything is happening. It's for those who believe in him. There shall be no deception on that day. A lot of church goers will not rise on that day. Oh. They will miss that great event. Oh. Some who were even genuine, I mean, genuine believers, genuinely saved. They were saved genuinely. But they will not make it because of unconfessed sins in their lives. Sins that they cover up. They will not be able to go. Some will not rise with him because of unforgiveness and malice. Because that day is a great day. My question to you as I'm rounding up is... Are you sure you will make it? Are you sure that you will make it? And you know, the fact that you are, you, are make, you are able to make it now does not mean you will make it on that day. Oh. Because that day is still far away. Between now and then, do you know what will have happened to you? Some people, they started the journey where they did well so far. But then suddenly, suddenly, they miss it. They are like those ten, ten uh, virgins who went to meet the lamb. I mean, the, 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 the bridegroom. The Bible said they took their lamps in their hands. Some, in addition, also brought additional oil but some did not bring additional oil 
And so the, the, the bridegroom delayed in arrival. He didn't come on time. And all of them slept. Everybody slept because he had delayed so long. Then eventually when they were not expecting, when they were snoring, they had, behold, here comes uh, the bridegroom. And everybody quickly woke up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Quickly, everybody carried their lamp. And the Bible said, they now discovered that those ones who didn't have, I mean, the lamp has died. The lamp had died. And those who didn't have extra oil, they now had problem. Are you sure you will make it on that day? Let us pray. Rise up on your feet. We are going to pray. I will not miss the rapture of the saints. I will not miss that glory of that day. In the name of Jesus. Pray. I will not miss it all. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And he loses his soul. I will not miss it on that day. Oh. Pray. Pray for yourself. Don't pray for me now. Just pray for yourself. I will not miss it. Jerusalem Toru Uri mi hilu mi Ile mi bamba kun Uri sun ayo mi Ibi ayo Ni gba wo le mi oro jure Olaru mi I will not miss it on that day. I will not miss it on that day. Uruki rani be be ni ko so shupa ako wa i wanyi Christi ni molembe ibi ayo. Ni ba wo le mi oro jure Olorun mi o dire ilu mi La fi pe se lo so Le kun re dan fun yi Wura ni itare Ibi ayo Ni ba wo le mi oro jure Olorun mi Jerusalem tonu Ori mi ilu mi ile mi gbamba ku ori ku mi ibi ayo Nigba wole mi oro 